Welcome everybody. This is Lori Novak with Photo Focus. Uh, this is the In Focus interview show. And today we're speaking with uh, Lisa Langell, who's a wildlife photographer located in Arizona. Um, I get the feeling she spends a lot of time in Alaska <laughs> too, though, which I'm a little jealous of. Um, most, most of us, I think, might be. Um, so uh, Lisa is on the board of directors of NANPA. She's a um, ambassador for Tamron, Photo Pro and h &Y Filters. And she has also uh, had images published with Outdoor Photographer, Arizona Highways, Ranger Rick, which is one of my personal favorites. Oh, I'm <laughs> glad that it is. Oh my gosh, do you remember that from when we I were kids? I do, I do. And it's what was so special to me. It was my oh, first two-page spread. And oh it was gosh. like my first, you know, major publication. And it was such a, like a sentimental, wonderful first full circle moment for me. And when people were sending me pictures of their kids reading the magazine, oh my, with my God, article, that's awesome. it was awesome. Right? It was, that's, yeah. that's like it goes on your refrigerator. Right? <laughs> it, <laughs> yes. It just felt so much more special. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. <laughs> so she, she has other public, other images published in other places too. Um, I think I said that you were on the board of directors for the North American Nature Photography Association, and I'm going to kind of um, turn it over to you a little bit. If you can tell us a little bit about your photography journey, kind of how you got into it, why wildlife, um, yes. and, you know, kind of how your journey through all of this has progressed, if you can just kind of let us know. Absolutely. Um, and thank you, Lori, for doing this with me. I really appreciate it. And I'm honored to be here. I, I have to start out by saying this one thing. Um, birds have changed my life. And that sounds so maybe odd for someone to say, but I think back to when I first started bird watching when I was a little kid, I was about eight years old. And my great aunt Jo uh, got me started with birding and I didn't know a sparrow from a goldfinch at the time and she walked me through these things and gradually I'd start getting better and, you know, over the years. I'd start listening to bird calls and trying to memorize them. And, you know, we'd go and do these big birding events at different places around. Um, I grew up in Michigan. So in Michigan and in Canada, I lived right on the border. And so we'd go bird watching and we'd uh, go to a place called Point Pelee, Ontario, Canada, which is phenomenal for the migration. And uh, we went, you know, and, and by this point I was getting older. I was maybe 12, 13, 14, somewhere in there. And I remember seeing these photographers with these big long lenses and they'd be carrying them around in these you know, wagons and stuff and I was like oh my gosh I want to do that and I had had a point and shoot camera right, right. you know that I would play with um but I really it, that was really kind of what sealed the deal for me with with photography and so I you know I got started as a kid and I would teach 4-H uh, you know kids in 4-H I would teach them how to do photography because I learned quite a bit about it and it was something that was a hobby for me but carried me all the way through you know high school I was yearbook editor college right. I did it for fun <laughs> when I went to graduate school I didn't have any time for fun but when I was done I picked that you know I had a Canon A1 I picked it right back up uh, after graduate school and continued from there and it's always been a fun hobby for me and much later in life uh you know a profession so that's awesome I love that I love that when you don't think about it at the time like your aunt probably never even thought about you know she just it was something for you to do with her and yes. to, to help you learn about nature and the birds and all that but how it affected you yeah. and, and I, I'm not sure that that people are always aware that what you're doing with kids and and even helping the kids in in 4-H yes you no know, you don't always realize how that affects them and where, where it might take them later in life. So that's, that's an awesome story though. Oh, and she was oh, amazing. Great. Like she would, she and I would have been best friends if she was alive today or we were the same age growing up. I mean, she was just, she was a little bit ahead of her time and just the neatest person. I just, and everybody loved being around her. I mean, she was epic. And uh, so <laughs> it's, a, it's truly the gift that keeps on giving. And, and I think awesome. of her all the time when I do this. Yeah. Right. Right. That's awesome. So how did you, I'm okay. So from birds, you ended up kind of veering. I mean, that's wildlife. Yeah, it's a little yeah. bit of its own genre too, but, but you've gone further into wildlife. Um, yes. Alaska obviously has amazing wildlife, which you, you it do does. quite a bit of. Um, so how did you get to that? 
Yeah. So, you know, n- nothing I do is straightforward. <laughs> so, you know, if I can, I could, I don't know if I could pick a more serpentine route to get to where I am today, but, you know, I've always loved doing the nature photography and that's kind of the impetus. I've always loved nature. You know, I, I mean, I was a little kid and I would build mud nests for yeah. birds. And I would, you know, dig tunnels in the snow drifts and yes. put like the the um uh, the cattail like fur I thought it was fur and I line it hoping little rabbits oh. would nest in there I mean I was kind <laughs> of awesome. crazy as a little kid but but I've always loved nature truly yeah. genuinely and um so it just followed that I would take pictures of it and of course you know we talked about Ranger Rick that magazine was so inspirational for me as a kid I devoured that thing when it would come in my inbox so or my mailbox so um so it was neat again you know to have been published there but you know that's always been a passion for me and then you know and I would photograph in my spare time it was always stuff that was outside and yeah. so that really got me started and then it was just kind of a natural fit to keep going in that direction and and not that I don't occasionally do some portraiture I like environmental portraiture I do cowboys and you know fun interesting I really love interesting characters as opposed to like you know 18 year old scantily clad models that's that's not my style (laughs) I will devour things though that are people in their natural environment and really capturing some beautiful portraiture so I will venture into those areas but wildlife is always you know my my first passion so and how how does Alaska play into this like how do you first you've been almost 50 times you said yeah I have this year marks 48 and um, yeah and why don't you just live there well (laughs) That, might that, was be a, a that was the first interview. thing that I thought of. I'm like, if she's been there that much, why not just live there? That that may uh, be in my future. Awesome. I, I have some things that I'm working on at the nice. moment and I can't share all the details yep. yet, but there are some really cool photographic things in my future. And uh, hopefully we can do another interview and yeah, talk about definitely. that. Because, That's exciting. There's some really big news happening and it isn't just about buying a house so right. <laughs> um, but there's some really cool stuff happening in Alaska um, but Alaska so once again uh, birds have changed my life and you know you never know when there's those little teeny tiny seemingly insignificant moments in your life that mm-hmm. end up sending you on a completely different trajectory and so and I haven't shared this story much publicly but um until now but when I um so as background I went to graduate school I became a psychologist um I was a floral designer through that time put myself through graduate school and 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 even before then I was a designer and that kind of ties into some of the mm-hmm. art things that I do with my photography but So I was a a psychologist and I worked in the schools, but then later I ended up working for a company out of the University of Minnesota that did tremendous research in the areas of interest to me, which was in um, early childhood prevention, English language learning for kids that were, uh, you know, some other language was their native language. I did a lot of research in that area. And this company was a young company that I was fascinated by the research they were doing. And they were applying the, this is like back in 2006, applying the web and some database decision-making and really good research and very quick assessments. And I won't go way down that road, but it, (laughs) that changed my life. And so I went from, you know, working for this startup to a multi-million dollar company where I was managing the training and professional development and we would use it in schools around the country and internationally. So I did a lot of work in Alaska by consulting with the State Department of Ed. And I was working in these village schools, um, you know, in remote areas in Alaska, Native Alaskan villages. My first trip to Alaska, Lori, was- That's amazing. It was. Yeah. Like- an amazing trajectory I didn't know I'd be on. And my first trip to Alaska was landing in Anchorage and flying 400 miles west in a semi-cargo plane, getting out, going in a two-seater Cessna, flying to a remote village with no water, very little power. Um, The school was really basically the only thing. There were no flush, you know, like you literally used um, you know, a container, right. <laughs> you go to the bathroom, right. there are no stores, no restaurants, no right. police, nothing. And wow. so I got my start there. And then later I was, um, 
it, I, it grew so much that I needed help. And I ended up hiring a teacher from Seward, Alaska to come and help train for me because there was so much work in Alaska to do. I couldn't do it all. And so I brought her along and we're walking down this, this sidewalk and there's a little creek and we were walking from one building to another as I was training her. And she looks and she says, oh, there's a merganser, which a merganser is a type of duck. And I was like, I said, you must be a birder. I didn't know anything about her other than I knew she <laughs> did this stuff really well. She goes, I am. She said, my parents own a lodge in the in Kenai, Alaska, Kenai uh, Peninsula in Alaska. And she said, they run birding and fishing tours. And she wow. said, my dad's one of the foremost birders in the state. I said, oh, you're wow. kidding me. Oh. <laughs> you have to come sometime. I'm like, I'd love to. So they called me a year later and they said, we'd love to bring you up and take a bunch of photos for our website would you be interested? And I was like, yes. So I came up and, and did all that in exchange for all the, the tours and lodging and they provided all of that. So then they wanted to do it again this, the second year because they wanted some more and, and different things. So I did it again. And very long story short, a few years later, I started my own photography business and wound up my very first tour that I ever did was in Alaska at that lodge. And I still use that lodge today and they've become like family to me. So once once again, birds have changed my life. Yeah, and but that's so, an amazing, it's an amazing story though. And it just, it, it's, it's awesome to see how it all just kind of fell into place. It, it did. You I mean, know? it is like, it's, it's, I mean, I still talk about it every time I see him or Ganser, I'm like that bird that's changed my <laughs> life. <laughs> that's where it all started. So uh, awesome. yeah, it's, it's been an interesting story and I no longer do the psychology now in 2010, I started my business and by 2015, it grew so much. I couldn't do both fields of work. So um, I let go of the psychology work and uh, I now do photography full time and, and I have loved every minute of it. It's hard. It's not easy, but I right. really enjoy right. the challenge. Yeah. Right. That's fantastic. And you love to hear those stories. I, I you know, so many people want to do those sorts of things or, I mean, a lot of people have, you know, yeah. moved on from the corporate world and all that and just, and just done their own thing, yes. whether it's photography or something else even. Yes. Yes. But, yes. So while, okay. So let's, let's take a look at some of your images. I think we're going to, we're going to focus on Alaska. There's a couple of other images though, that we talked about earlier that I would like to share because they're interesting in a different way. Yes. Um, let me share my screen here. Sharing desktop too. And we should be able to see that, right? Oh yeah, definitely. All right. So um, this is obviously Alaska. To me, it's obvious. And I just <laughs> yeah. noticed something else in this image that I didn't see the first time. And that's the little oh. fish outside on the outside. Yes. Yes, oh those gosh. little guys. <laughs> There's That's just amazing. a whole story going on with this yes, image. And, yeah, absolutely. And if, if anybody has not photographed whales before, it, these whales were lunge feeding their humpback whales and they're lunge feeding, L-U-N-G-E, which means they dive deep and they swim up quickly to the surface and there's a bait ball of small fish circling like a school of fish right. and they try to engulf as many as they can in their mouth at a time trying to anticipate where that's going to happen is very difficult as a photographer because it happens in an instant <laughs> and you know you're looking at calm seas and then where's the whale going to appear right. but a little tell is the gulls up ahead will see the bait ball so if all of a sudden you see uh, you know multiple gulls kind of in an area that's a good place to put your camera and you're going to hope for action to happen. So this whale came up, grabs this huge mouthful of water and fish. And those little fish that you notice, Lori, are the ones that caught away. So they right. literally <laughs> just escaped with their life. But then I laugh because there's a so gull funny. at the bottom with one in its mouth. So right. like, you know, you, you're damned if you do and you're yeah. damned if you don't. Right. It was his time to go. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It was his time. But that's the chaos that happens in an instant. And that is in Resurrection Bay in Alaska, um, near Seward, Alaska. That's amazing. Oh, we're stuck. Oh, there we go. Okay. That we just we just cut out for a second. I heard oh. Seward, Alaska. Oh. Yes, that so that whale was photographed in Seward, Alaska. Oh, okay. okay. Um, out in Resurrection Bay. It's one of the things that I do on my tours. We go way out into the Gulf and get, you know, whales and puffins and murs and sea lions and it, tons of stuff but uh this awesome. was one of those moments where he was pretty close to shore um, i think we're stuck again oh there we go 
Um, this is another one that I, there's two of them that are similar to this. Are you? I'm here, Lori. I'm, I don't know. A different know way, if... but they both look to a shot kind of similarly. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All yeah, right. I think we, okay. There's a glitch in the universe. Um, this one, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I know. It just it happened. It's like everybody that's doing, you know, we're all used to this after the last year and a half, I think. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I think we're okay. So go ahead, yeah. Lori. So I just this one and this this one are are similar in a way, and I'm wondering if the technique you used was similar, um, if there was a flash involved, and and kind of how you went about yeah. getting these. Yeah. Um, because again, they're they're different, obviously, but they're they're as a photographer, when I look at both of them, I, it seems like they could be possibly shot in a similar manner. You're, you're so correct, Lori, and in like completely different outcomes, but similar processes. Uh, there are some differences. So this one here, I call oh, okay. humbug. Yep. Oh. <laughs> nope, I'll go there. We'll okay. There. So this one here, I, I call humbug because it's a hummer <laughs> and a bug. So right. humbug. Uh, but this one was shot. I actually didn't know that the wasp was there in the image until I got it on the computer. So, wow. you know, yeah, it was just one of those moments. So what's happening is there's a bird feeder, a hummingbird feeder off camera here. Mm -hmm. And the hummingbird was flying into the feeder. Well, there was a wasp on that feeder, a hummingbird feeder. And the wasp and the hummingbird don't get along. Hummingbirds can get stung <laughs> by the wasps. Oh. So hummingbirds are always a little like, eh, there's a wasp. I don't know that I should go in. They're kind of, very, they give the wasp a lot of birth. But this wasp turned around just as the hummingbird was coming in and they both put on their brakes in midair. And it just, I mean, it was just one of those split second photos that, yeah. that I happened to capture. And the white background is not because I spent, you know, hours trying to cut out a bird and, you know, put it on a white <laughs> background. That would be way too much work for me. But yeah. <laughs> what it is, is there is a piece of white board uh, in the distance behind the bird. And we're photographing this using uh, multi-flash setups. So okay. we have speed lights and the speed light is actually what uh, freezes the action in the wings or whatever else is going on. Right. Because the speed lights are used at low power. So like 1 16th to 1 32nd power is just at the tiniest, tiniest, quickest burst of light. Like your retina can't even react to it. It's so fast. And so that is an, that little pulse of light is enough to freeze the action in your image. So your shutter speeds are actually quite slow, like relatively speaking for wildlife, 1 25th, 1 60th of a second. Okay. But it's that tiny burst of light that actually illuminates everything. And then there's a second set of lights on the backdrop. So I use whiteboard, there's a backdrop, and I teach all of this in my hummingbird workshops. But you can get this really simple look. And there's a lot of different looks that we can create with this method. This just happens to be one of them. But I always love the high key looks because from an artistic perspective or from a home sale perspective, the color palette's simple. People really gravitate to it. It's not always favorited by contests and competitions and magazines. Right, but those, that's right. a different genre. That's a different need. Uh, but when you look at home interiors and, and offices and what people want for that, this is a much better fit. So I kind right. of think of it like bilingual photography. I can do your contest and competition yes, and right, calendar right. stuff, magazines, but then right. you also need to speak the language of home interiors. And, and that I had a lot of experience with as right. a floral designer. So. Oh, right. Excellent. Yeah. So this was done in the same manner. It's similar, yes. So we have multi-flash setups, right? Um, but in this case, the uh, the agave flower that you see there, which is mm -hmm. what these nectar bats feed on, um, the agave flower has. You can't see it, but there is a, uh, a like a lidar radar kind of you know. Uh, beam. And as soon as the bat flies across the beam, it triggers the flashes. So mm -hmm. we have a few flashes set up and this trigger, trigger um, as soon as they fly, we, get, we got to adjust it all correctly in advance. And as soon as they fly through that, that's what makes the image. So your shutter speeds are long. They are six to 10 seconds long. It's pitch black everywhere. Amazing. And then when the bat flies through that, and they will, because they will you know, they take advantage of the, the nectar from the agave. Um, as soon as they fly through that, 
that's what actually will create enough light to freeze the action and then everything stays black because when there's no flash it's pitch black that's, um, ama that's, that's amazing and yeah, it's, it's really interesting to, to hear that or see or have you explain how it works yeah and you don't need to be super far away i typically shoot these with my tamron 70 to 210 yeah and that's enough to zoom in close enough to get the bird or the bird, the bat and, uh, you know, the flower. And, you know, we set these up and literally you can set it up and, you know, go sit in a chair in the parking lot or wherever just you're wait. at <laughs> and just wait because all the heavy lifting, all of the kind of mental work, the technical stuff happens on the front end. It's sort of like a time lapse. You got to get all those things ready. And then once it's all there, you set your camera and forget it. And you just wait until you're done. And, you know, you can wait a couple hours and then go home and look at your pictures and you've got, you know, bats in a lot of the frames. So it's, very it's really cool. fun. And it's something we teach in my workshops as well. So good very, times for that. Very cool. Yeah. This guy, these guys, I'm going to, I'm, assuming is Alaska again. It is. And this is, this is kind of something we talked about too, or you mentioned it earlier um, about the high key and the difference between like creating art work yes. or creating a natural environment image that, that would go for like wildlife in an outdoor photographer magazine or something like that, because it, yeah. they probably wouldn't accept this. It, well, the, the irony is that Outdoor Photographer did a feature article and a cover um, with this style of my oh, work with high oh, key and, cool. and things like that. But it was done to kind of open up people's eyes mm -hmm. to a different genre. So your camera can be used in a lot of different ways for a lot right. of different purposes. And, you know, I've really realized over the years that most of the training and teaching that we have been given as photographers, especially wildlife photographers, has been more to satiate that market for calendars and magazines. And then even competitions have been designed around those rules. But we've right. never really thought about the rules for other types of markets, if you will, for photography. Right, right. And, you know, I kind of blend some of that. I know I was a floral designer, but I did a lot of work with interior designers as well. And so I'm kind of using those rules and, and taking my camera and taking photographs and using them and purposing for them in those markets as well. And that's been fun for me. So something like this, you know, unless it was by special request, wouldn't typically work for many contests and right, competitions right. or magazines because they want journalistic style. Right. Um, this is not that. And, and I acknowledge that I, I there is a difference in a different market. And so, um, yes, this is a real image, but then the processing techniques, and I did shoot it in high key, uh, but then it did require some Photoshop to just kind of have it look the way I wanted where it's almost sketch like you know it almost right. looks like a pen and ink and that was the effect that I was going for cool that's cool it's nice to and it's it's nice as photographers or artists to be able to to do what you want also yes. you know and be like yes. not not just like okay you you're shooting this so you have to do that you know and yes. it's nice to just kind of break away from that and say, well, I'm going to see what happens if I do this or use these filters or use this brush or, you know, and, and, right. and kind of play with things to see what you can create differently, um, you know, without necessarily always having to be true to, you know, whatever was right in front of you. It's, it's so true. And it's, I think it's really about being aware that there are a lot of different places where your photographs can be used. And it's a, a understanding how to prepare them for each of those things and how to shoot for each of those markets. It's, it, there isn't just one little narrow scope. And I think right. sometimes that scope that we've been taught takes over everything and we don't, you know, and, and things that are not quote unquote out of the camera get kind of poo pooed. And it's because people are only thinking about through, you know, through that lens, right. no, no pun right. intended, of one particular genre and set of requirements for images. But there's a whole, whole gamut so of many. requirements for images <laughs> yes. when you start looking through other markets and other needs. And that's kind of something I've advocated for, because I think as photographers, we need to be aware that there's more than one way to do it, so to speak. Right. And like, I, I think it's changing somewhat. I think it's changed somewhat over the years. Like it's gotten a little bit yes. more open to those things. There's been more artistic, there's yes. more, you know, as digital and digital processing changes, um, you know, uh, there's been more digital art, you yes. know, which, which is, is easily, easily started with a photograph. Yes. You know, I mean, obviously you can do things from scratch, but, but to take a photograph and then create art from it, 
um, is obviously way more accepted than it used to be. Yes. Um, and that goes in hand with selling to places that, that, um, buy art, you know, right. like, like fine art America is just the one that, that always pops up from, yeah. from my experience. Um, but yes. there's plenty of others out there that do this a similar thing. Well, so. and it's so true. And it's no different if you were painting. I mean, if, right. if I told you the only thing you can do is watercolors and you need to use these four brushes and that's right. all you can do. And it has to be in this aspect ratio and, you know, and all those things. I mean, then we'd never have wonderful artists like Jackson Pollock who threw paint literally yes, on right. a canvas, you know, right. and, exactly. and, uh, and, and did quite well with that, obviously. Exactly. So, um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of reasons why, you know, being individualistic with what you're doing. And, and I think a big part of it is understanding your market and who you're appealing to. And it doesn't mean that you're selling your work. It's just, what's your style? Where, what are you going for? What, yeah. what do you want to do with that? Where ideally would you love your image to live if it could and, and right. use that as a compass? And it's, it's hard to, I think to, you know, we're taught all the basics, the photography, the technical stuff, the, yes. the F stops and all that. And we're composition and, but, and, there's very few um, that you find out there. And I've seen a little bit more of this recently, but there's more like color theory yes. and the art related courses or things that you learned in art, even art history. I mean, yes. to go into a museum and, and study the paintings by the masters and look at the color and the light and the way they painted can so be applied to your photography. Absolutely. And a lot of times that stuff just gets kind of like pushed to the side or or like a PS, oh, by the way, this would be really cool to look at sometime if you have time or, you know, <laughs> yes, um, yes. but it, it's really an important part of the process. It, if you're it really, if you're, especially if you're using it as art, if you're just taking photos and you're, a, you know, working, you know, as a newspaper or magazine photographer, then it's a little bit different, but if you really want to pursue things as an artist yes. and, and sell art, then those things are very important to, to learn about. It, it is. And to not, I think this is important as well, not just accept what someone tells you yes. as that is the written set of rules. And in, right. in one in particular that I hear so often is, you know, well, in, in this country, people read from left to right. So your images have to, you know, flow in a certain way or be positioned a certain way on the canvas. And, and you know, in other countries that don't read left to right, it's different. And if you look at the research, there's a wonderful gentleman by the name of Dan Hill, and he wrote a book, I think it's called At First Blush, if I remember correctly, fascinating book I've listened to him speak and he does actual research with real people and does these eye tracking studies and he's debunked things like that and and I think it's really important to not just accept what everybody tells you I mean take take it as a note but then really go and discover what actually is working and working for you and I think you know for me I I, I mean I listen to a lot of things but I still really just stay in my lane and kind of don't let too much become overwhelming chatter and I just stay focused and it, it for me it's worked really well but I do use a lot of things that I've learned and a lot of things that I've read and researched and and that helps inform my photography but even then I still just do my thing and yeah. you know I think that's important too I, I do too I agree so this is I had to choose puffins because I love yes. puffins um but <laughs> I, I just you know these are I wasn't really aware that there were puffins up in Alaska I guess I never really thought about it um and I, that you had said before we started the call that there's different types, yes. but what I, I love this. I love that you caught him with his, his wingspan totally out, but the, the looks in their eyes are like, they're looking at you. Like, what are you doing? Why are you looking at me? You know, like, <laughs> I call this show off because I just right. feel like he's like, ta-da. Yeah. And so this pair of puffins, um, you can't, they're they're not sexually dimorphic so you can't really tell you know at a glance who's who but um this pair of puffins are they're called tufted puffins because of those creamy tufts that they have growing out of the tops of their heads that is uh this is in breeding plumage and by the way a little trivia that you may not know or anyone listening those conical beaks those big orange beaks that is chitin and that will fall off at the end of breeding season and underneath will be a much smaller uh, version of that. And so that is, that is a breeding only kind of thing. And I, I just find, you know, animal, what they do for breeding and how they, yeah. you know, <laughs> they get all fluffed up is just kind of interesting. Uh, but 
these pair of puffins were in Homer, Alaska, which is one of my favorite places to photograph puffins because we're in the bay and the boat that I charter is, uh, it's, you know, it's small so we can get in these little nooks and, crev you know, crevices and things and, and the, the waves typically aren't as crazy as they can be out in the Gulf of Alaska where we look for whales. And so um, these two puffins, and I have to say, it is so hard to photograph puffins. Uh, <laughs> they are fast, they dive, they're skittish. So yeah. when these two happen to be together, two yeah. in a frame is awesome. And this guy displayed right when I happen to be focusing on them. And the two are in focus, both sets of eyes. Like to me, it was a home run. Right, and, right. Um, I you, shot, when yeah. you shoot this, do you shoot manual focus? Are you using any kind of tracking or... Great question. So this is the first year that I have shot with the Canon R5 mirrorless oh, camera, okay. and it has the eye tracking, which is, I got to say, uh, every time I've gotten a new camera over the past, I don't know, 10, 20 years, I've always felt like, okay, that's that's a nice improvement. You know, right. this you know, it's got a little better this or that, or the noise is less or whatever. Right. This is the first time I've honestly felt like this isn't an improvement. Like this is an upgrade and, wow. and it is really palpable. And so um, I really enjoyed using this. The eye tracking is tremendous for birds. Um, so I shot that with the R5 and then my Tamron 150 to 600, which is not native for mirrorless, but I have the adapter, right. a little $99 adapter. Right. Um, and it was an exquisite com like, I can't even tell you <laughs> that's awesome to hear what a difference it made I mean it was phenomenal tack sharp easy to track focus I mean it my hit rate just I mean I'm, I'm a big fan of technique but I gotta say your hit rate with this new eye tracking and that lens combination it it was through the roof I I just I was delighted I have so many images from Alaska I haven't had time to process since I got back but it just was phenomenal. That's um, good yeah. to know. Very, really very good great. to know. Cool. That's awesome. That's, ex that's kind of exciting. I'm not ready for another one yet, but let's do, <laughs> when you let's, do. <laughs> yeah, no, it's on my, it was in my cart for a while when I took it out. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's do one more because they're cute. Sure. Like, oops. Oh, the otters. <laughs> you know what I, you know what I first thought when I saw this, you know, yeah. how some people do in topaz or some of, uh, some of the, um, other editing, how they make yes. it look like fire. Yeah. So like his his oh, fur looks yeah. like it cause it's wet, you know, it because does. It's, wet and it's like, and yes. I, I was like, Oh, I have to look closer because that's just how it looks. It's not, you, you didn't edit it to be that way. <laughs> no, that, that is just the way the hair <laughs> happened to be on that little baby. Um, so these otter, this was another photo from Homer. Uh, we can usually get, uh, you know, I'm always very sensitive to the comfort of wildlife. And so is the captain that I use. Um, mm -hmm. He's a, he's a wildlife expert and we're very cautious, but these animals will let us get, if we're careful and we're slow, will let us get pretty close. And, um, and there's a otter nursery out there. And so a lot of these moms will have their babies and they oh carry them with them. An otter can have babies at any time of year. Um, so you'll get, you know, a variety of ages. This baby is a little bit older. Some of them are quite young, but the mom will float on her back and, and keep the baby out of the water. Um, but what's interesting about these otter is that their, their fur is so dense. It's more dense than any other mammal. They have about a million hairs per square inch. And that's what helps Amazing. keeps them warm um, in those icy waters throughout the year. So uh, pretty amazing. So she's kind of looking at me and the baby's looking at me and, uh, you know, we got this moment, but, uh, and again, I shot this in high key. So mm -hmm. exposed for, to, to get that white background. Right. And then, um, I do a little Photoshop processing just to kind of finish off that look and have the foreground and background kind of fade away. Um, but this is another high key style and requires the right lighting and the right settings to do, but it's one of my favorite things to do in an image. No, they work, they work well. And, and you can see, and I'll just flip through these really quick. You can see yeah. how they, they work well together. So if somebody's yes. doing decorating and they love wildlife or they love Alaska wildlife and they want yes. one of each or something, it works yes. well together. And that that's a big thing for me is doing these pieces that can be put together as a series on the wall and it doesn't right. look, you know, hodgepodge. It actually looks cohesive. So right. high key helps with that. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Very cool. Thanks, amazing, Lori. amazing images. I, I, you know, it makes me want to go. I want to go. <laughs> Come on along. <laughs> um, I might, you never know. I might. 
Um, so what, what you go on a trip like this and, and you, you shoot Tamron, um, I obviously, do. I mean, you're an ambassador, so you, not that you have to, but <laughs> I'm sure you, you know, it helps. Yeah. Um, do you, what, which lenses do you use? Like, what do you think you use the most? And then what are your favorites? Yeah. Or is that the same? Is it the same, the favorite it, and the use most? It's probably, well, <laughs> I can definitely say the Tamron 150 to 600 G2, um, huge improvement over the original one. That lens is amazing. And uh, I have loved that lens. I, it really does a nice job. And uh, one little secret, um, if anybody owns one, one of the best things that I can recommend, unless you have a mirrorless camera, because you wouldn't need it for that, but is to get your lens calibrated with your DSLR and that will optimize your focus. And they do that yeah. for free. It's a three-day turnaround if you purchase a Tamron lens. And, and that's something I do annually. Now that I have the mirrorless camera, I don't need to do it for that, but I will still do it with my 5D Mark IV or, you know, I still have a 7D Mark II as well that I'll occasionally use. But um, that's really important for that lens. And that lens is amazing. Um, and one of the reasons why I switched to it was actually at the impetus of a client of mine, well, several clients were saying, Lisa, I want to go on your Alaska workshop, but I know you shoot with a Canon 500 F4, which is, you know, now it's, I don't know, maybe $9,000 lens. And, and they're like, I either go on the trip or I get that lens. I can't right. do both. <laughs> right. And I get that. I, I say yes. forever to get that lens. And, um, you know, they're like, what do you recommend? And I really I mean, I could read reviews, but I didn't really have my own personal gut feeling about, you know, Sigmas and Tamrons and any other models right. that were out there. Right. And so um, I borrowed um, from a, a camera store, the Sigma and the Tamron uh, 150 to 600, the Sigma Contemporary and the, and the Tamron G2. And I tried them out for a couple of months to just to have my own feelings of right, it. Right. And very long story short, the Tamron works so well for me and my shooting style and my camera body that I ended up buying it. And then I was like, well, I'll just have it as an extra, right? I still really <laughs> loved my, my, my Canon 500 F4. I mean, that lens was like my baby. And then what I found out is like, every time I'd want to go out and shoot, I'm like, ah, I'm just going to take the Tamron because the other thing's so heavy. And I just kind of want to do this <laughs> and ended up doing that so much for two years. It sat in my closet and I finally sold the 500 <laughs> and I have been using the Tamron ever since. So my experience is really, you know, my passion for Tamron gear and, and I own multiple lenses. They're awesome, but it really comes from personal experience. And I, I've yep. just really enjoyed the way they work. And I can get images that I couldn't get with the 500 prime because I can zoom in or out. I can change compositions. Right. I can, right. you have a, it, a little more flexibility with what you can can't. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and as a female, I, when I used to carry that big long lens and I, I didn't have a problem carrying it, I mean, it is heavy, but I could do it. Right. Um, what I notice, and this is a weird side effect is it, my Tamron draws far less attention. If I'm out in the field, I get approached by fewer people about, can you shoot yeah. the moon with that? And this, and, that. and, <laughs> and I get far fewer interruptions. And usually when people mean well, but they interrupt you right at the critical yeah, moment. Right. And so it's allowed me to kind of get back a little bit of That's interesting. Uh, yeah. I wonder and, if it's just because the cannon is white. And yeah, the Tamron and, is black and well, people and just Canon, don't know, you yeah. know, or and the Canon's big. I mean, yeah, compared I, to the Tamron, yeah. the Tamron yeah. weighs half of what that other right, lens did. Right. And you know, it's like wearing a cotton ball around your neck after you know, <laughs> anything else. But um, but I, you know, it's a side effect. And also when I travel alone, I, I really didn't like the attention that that other lens mm -hmm. would get, right. you know, from a safety perspective. Yeah. I've been in a couple of situations where I didn't trust the people that were around me, I was kind of alone. And, and right. it was just nice to have a smaller footprint of a lens, right. and it, you know, fits right. in your bag better and all of that. But that's, that's my go-to lens. Nice. And, uh, but I, I have to say, I also love, they have a 15 to 30 G2 that is like butter and then a 35 to 150. That is an awesome, awesome portrait lens and also a really good walking around lens as well. It's just sharp from end to end. It, Tamron's really uh, developed a lot of really cool things. I've been so thrilled to be a part of it. And the people are awesome there. I, it's like this wonderful company from inside and out and having working in the corporate world for so many years, being at a place where it has such a great corporate culture, even though I'm just an ambassador, not an employee. Right, right. 
but it, it really it comes shows through, through. it does yeah, it does, come it does. Yeah. and i've i've actually i two let's see i guess it's three years ago now i ended up buying the 100 to 400 yes that's because awesome it was a, it was on sale it was at the wppi show somebody was using it in a booth like to do a, a demonstration he's like here hold this i'm like oh my god that's so light <laughs> i know <laughs> and i i had a 70 to 300 canon yes I've for 10 it was 10 years old i mean yeah. i had it for 10 years it was still fine yeah and i use it a ton you know um yes. but i I've got that. I ended up, I'm like, you know what? I haven't had a new lens in 10 years. I'm just yeah. going to get this. And I, I love it. And I use it probably 90% of the time. And, and it's an, it's such an affordable piece. And I have that lens yeah. as well. Yeah. And it is sharp yep. from end to end. Yeah. I, and I'm it really, is a, yeah. Isn't it? Happy, it's, it. happy yes. with that. Yeah. Now I just wrote down the other ones you mentioned. So I'm like, Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and I have their 24 to 70, which is gorgeous as well. I, I mean, I, I really, I, I say this genuinely, I have not found anything that I've obtained in the last five years since I've been an ambassador that I haven't loved. I yeah. mean, it's just, they have really upped their game lately. And, and Tamron's the largest lens manufacturer in the world. And, um, and it shows, I mean, they, they really know their game and that's why a lot of things can be more affordable is they just make so many more than anybody right, else right. too. So. Good to, good to know. So lastly, because you're a wildlife photographer, primarily, I'm just going to have you, if you could share a few tips, um, with our audience for shooting wildlife. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I know I, there's a, that kind of is a wide spectrum of things, but yeah. like your go-to tips when you're out teaching. Yes. I think one of them, biggest things that that people make the mistake of is is with regard to manual settings I'll you know I'll talk about wildlife in a minute but people worry so much about manual settings it's okay if you shoot shutter priority it's okay if you shoot aperture priority if you're understanding what you want from it it right. doesn't mean that you know like unless you can shoot manual you're like less than as a photographer <laughs> I think it's about understanding your choices and what makes the most sense for that given thing. But one of the things that I often will see is photographers who um, use too slow shutter speeds and they, they are like, I can't, my focus is wrong. And many times it's not the focus, it's that the subject is moving right. faster through that frame. And as we get into more and more pixels and people are cropping in deeper and deeper into that you know image, that file, your shutter speed is really going to have to be up there because little movement uh, can make a, a lot of difference if you're cropping in quite a bit. I'm still kind of a cautious cropper, but I know a lot of people will crop a lot right. and that's going to make a difference. So just shutter speed, keeping it up, um, it's going to vary on the subject, but, um, but watching for that. And I think um, paying attention to the little details in wildlife. I don't care if you're using a, a phone or $20,000 worth of gear, just those little details, like are the ears pricked forward? Is the eye have a catch light? Is the light looking good? And, and above all, I don't care if you have the most rare, amazing subject ever. If your foreground and background aren't supporting that subject in the best way possible, then you need to wait for it to move into a better foreground or background. You know, if you're shooting and there's weeds in the front and trees right behind it, and it's all a jumbled, busy mess. Um, I don't care how beautiful that moose or that bear or whatever <laughs> it is you're photographing. It's not going to be a pretty picture. I've walked away from scenes where, you know, everything else is right. The light's good. The animal's great. The focus distance is great. I can fill the frame if I want to. But if that background and foreground look terrible, it's just just too hard to get a decent image out of that. And, and I think people wonder, why do photographers get these great images? And it's because we're looking not only at subject and your settings, but the foreground and background yeah. and making sure that light works and that you have these nice, clean or complementary foregrounds and backgrounds. And that that you can do with a cell phone. You just got to pay attention to those right, things. Right, right. Right. Those are awesome. Awesome tips. And they actually apply to almost any kind of photography, to be honest. They do. They do. Yeah. Right. Macro, flowers, everything. still yeah. life, portraits. Yeah. Yep. It's the foreground and background is every bit as important as your yep. subject. And, and it's just, you know, it's, it's getting all those three things to align, right. which isn't always right. easy. Yeah. 
This has been awesome. I thank you so much. And if you guys um, in the show notes and when we post the video uh, in the article, we'll put a link to Lisa's, uh, both of your sites, the, the, the educational site and your photography site. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's Lisa, L-I-S-A-L-A-N-G-E-L-L. Yes. Um, and the website is langelphotography.com. And the other one is focusyourart.com. Yes. Um, and I appreciate you coming on our show. It's been awesome. It's been great to meet you personally. Same for um, you, Lori. I we'll, know we'll cross paths somewhere. I'm, I'm guessing. I hope so. <laughs> Maybe I hope Alaska. so. <laughs> <laughs> I, that would be amazing. You need to come back. It's a great place. <laughs> yeah. Come back. Not on a cruise ship. <laughs> <laughs> I know that cruise ships are a little like photography jail for me. Oh my God. It was, <laughs> so. it was my, it was my mom's trip. So that yeah. was all that mattered. You got to do that. Yeah. Yep. You do. So I appreciate you taking the time to do this and talk with us today. It was very interesting. Your images are awesome. And it's always fun to see those things that you don't always get to see in your own areas. So, so, true. so thank true. you so much. Lori, it was my honor and pleasure. I really appreciate it. So nice to do this. And I look forward to doing something together again. Thanks. Thanks.